and welcome to the latest edition of Technician's Update. In this programme, the third in the series, myself and Andy Hobday will take you through a number of technical subjects which hopefully will provide some useful information to yourselves at the sharp end. OK, first of all, timing belt tensioning procedure on our old friend, the M16 engine. It's no longer produced since it was displaced by the T-Series engine in Rover 200 but the timing belt tensioning procedure is still causing some problems. Now the main problem we're finding is that the timing belt is set over slack and that in turn leads after a period of time to either the belt jumping teeth on the pulleys or even stripping teeth from the belt itself which as you can probably imagine on the M16 engine can cause a fair bit of engine damage. Now what we've come up with in this bulletin is a completely revised tensioning procedure and a little bit of a service fix to carry out on the tensioner pulley. So first of all, that fix to the tensioner pulley. Now what we found was one of the reasons why the belts were being set over slack was because this hardened ground finish on the back of the pulley was causing the pulley to slip as the clamp bolt was tightened. Now the way we get around that is actually quite simple. And what we do is place a disc of P220 wet and dry paper behind the pulley and that provides some sort of resistance as you tighten that bolt and thus prevents the pulley from slipping. Now in true Blue Peter style, this is one I prepared earlier, so we have a 40 millimetres diameter disc manufactured from P220 wet and dry and we place that over the clamp bolt with the rough face towards this hardened ground surface and like that we then fit the pulley. Now obviously at this stage you would have your camshaft locking tool fitted and also your flywheel locking pin to make sure the engine is maintained in its time position. So there we have the fix to that tensioner pulley a little anti-slip washer manufactured which stops the pulley rotating as the clamp bolts tightened. Now to the procedure itself. As I said the procedure is entirely new. What we've done is taken the best points from K and T series engine and applied them to the M16. So instead of using the burrows gauge as your main means of adjustment as you were on the old procedure, you're now using the engine to apply tension to the belt and then taking the resultant slack out of the belt by turning the tensioner pulley. What we have to do first but though before we get into the main adjustment procedure itself is remove all this obviously excess slack from the belt here. If we didn't, when we turn the engine you'll find that those teeth would simply ride the teeth on the pulleys and upset your timing. So it's not a tensioning procedure, not a tensioning process, but we simply turn the tensioner anti-clockwise using the wrong end of an Allen key and only light finger pressure just to remove that excess slack. With that done, we simply tighten the bolt and we're ready then to get into the meat of the tensioning procedure itself. Now, with the M16 engine, we haven't got the luxury of a semi-automatic tensioner. But we found that with a little bit of care we can actually provide the same function using our Allen key. So as with the K and T series procedure we turn the engine through two revolutions until we get those camshaft timing marks aligning again Now there's no need really for any degree of accuracy in this. You, you don't, for instance, need to fit the camshaft locking tool and the flywheel pin at this stage. It's just an approximate alignment you're looking for. Now that done, you'll find that all that tension, all the slack rather, has been pushed round to the slack side of the engine and we can now take it up with our tensioner pulley. Now again, it's important to emphasise that is, this isn't a tensioning process it's simply a process to remove slack from the belt. So turn the pulley again using light finger pressure anti-clockwise, remove the slack 
and then you would actually tighten the clamp bolt to 45 Newton meters, obviously using a torque wrench. Now our Burroughs gauge isn't redundant altogether, but instead of being the main means of adjustment as it was in the old procedure, it's now purely a checking medium. We check the belt as before in the mid span between the two camshaft pulleys and we're looking for a nice wide tolerance of between 6 and 10 units. Okay, I'm just over 7 here, so I'm within tolerance. Now, the Burroughs gauge is a piece of minimum standards equipment, so you should have one, it should be available, and it should be, above all, correctly calibrated. If, however, for any reason you don't have the Burroughs gauge available, then we do provide a template with the bulletin for the manufacture of a card gauge such as this. Now what you can do is apply this gauge and align the top edge with the top of the belt and then applying firm thumb pressure in the centre of the belt span, you should find that the belt won't deflect below this notch which happens to be a depth of six millimetres. If it does, as with an outer spec Burroughs gauge reading, you would have to carry out the whole tensioning process again. Okay, that just about rounds up M16 timing belt tensioning procedure. Andy. Now introduced on the 93 model year Rover 800 series was SRS. And what's SRS? Well, SRS stands for Supplementary Restraint System, and in this case means the vehicle's fitted with a driver's side airbag. The system comprises of two blue-coloured crash sensors under the bonnet here. A control unit, or DCU, mounted on the transmission tunnel below the radio. And an airbag module located in the centre of the steering wheel here that's designed to inflate very quickly during a head-on impact and works in conjunction with the driver's seat belt to protect the upper torso. Now, there are a number of important do's and don'ts that you must observe when working on an airbag system. The first and probably the most important is always disconnect the battery, disconnect the orange rotary coupler multi-plug and remove the key from the ignition before you start work on the airbag system and you'll need to carry out these precautions when you're working on other vehicle systems that are maybe only related to the airbag system and these will help make sure the airbag doesn't go off accidentally. Now another very important part of the system is the harness. It's easily recognisable, it's bright yellow. If you tamper with it you could seriously affect the operation of the airbag so you must never do that. Now another thing that you will need when working on the airbag system is one of these, a microcheck card. You'll also need its accompanying harness. The diagnostic port that you'll need to connect your microcheck into can be found just to the left of the DCU. Now, although the airbag module has a lifespan of 10 years, it should be visually inspected on an annual basis to make sure there aren't any cracks or the, the unit isn't distorted. If it is, then you'll need to replace it. Now, on the topic of replacing airbag components, you'll notice when you receive parts from Unipart, you'll have a shock watch attached to the package. Now, if the shock watch is still white, as this one is, it means the component inside should be OK. However, if it's changed to a red colour, then it means the package has received a knock at some time during its travels. The part mustn't be fitted, but must be returned to Unipart straight away. Now, just a quick word on airbag storage. The module itself must always be stored in a face-up condition like this, and it must be stored away from fuel, oil, detergents, or any source of excessive heat. It's fairly obvious why you need to store it up that way. If you store it face down and the unit's accidentally triggered for any reason, then it will propel itself upwards at great speed and with great force, so be careful. Now just another point on the module, if you do at any time have to replace this, then the old one must be deployed using the special tool and then incinerated. For full details 
of the SRS system, including details of the safety precautions and repair information, then refer to the SRS manual and the Repair Information Bulletin 4592 issued in December last year. And always refer to this information before you start work on the airbag system. Now, introduced on the Rover 800 Coupe, because of its frameless doors, is a new operating mechanism for the front windows, where the door glass is held in a cassette assembly, which is then bolted into the door as a separate unit. And this design is also used on the 200 Coupe for the same reason. Now, the unit consists of a cassette frame and cheetah panel, a motor and two drive cables, and a door glass. The door glass is secured to the cassette by these two clamp plates, then driven up and down by the motor via these two drive cables. Now, if necessary, the motor, the two cables, and the door glass can be replaced individually, as can the cassette frame together with the cheetah panel. Now, there are a number of major do's and don'ts to be aware of when working on a cassette assembly like this. The first is never alter the position of this stop screw. If you do change its position, then you could end up with major problems. Now, another thing that you should never do is alter the position of this lifting plate on the cable by undoing this clamp bolt here. If you do have to change the cable, you'll find that a new clamp plate will come already clamped in position on the cable. And finally, the last thing you, you must never do, you'll notice that the cheetah panel comes complete with the frame. Never use that as a lifting handle or knock it out of position. If you do, then you'll need to replace the whole cassette frame. We'll now briefly look at the adjustments you'll need to carry out in service when reassembling the cassette assembly. Now, the first thing you'll need to do is make sure the glass is secured to the lifting plates in the correct position. And you can tailor that by adjusting or selecting the correct combination of shims that sandwich between the plastic inner clamp plate and each of the lifting brackets. And you'll need to set the glass so it runs through the, this channel in the cheetah panel without distorting either the inner or outer part of the seal as it moves up and down. The second adjustment, once that's set, is carried out with the door glass in the fully up position. So move the door glass fully up, and what you're looking for is to make sure that the front edge of the door glass is aligned exactly with the front edge of the cheetah panel. If it's not, and you need to adjust its position, then just slacken off these clamp plates just slightly, reposition the glass, and then re-torque those clamp plates. And then the glass will be secured to the cassette in its right position. What you'll need to do then is refit the cassette loosely into the door and carry out two further adjustments on the car which will make sure that the cassette itself is positioned to the door and the car in the right position. Now the cassette assembly secures to the door with seven bolts. There's five along the top edge here and there's two at the bottom. With those all loose, you'll need to carry out your first adjustment, which is the height of the cassette, with the seal removed. And you'll need to fit special tool 18G 1658, which are three small plastic blocks, which, with the seal removed, secure into the seal track and lock in with a turn of 90 degrees. And then, with the aid of a suction cup mounted on the outside of the door glass and a colleague inside lift the glass and butt the glass up to the special blocks and then with that held in that position get your colleague to torque tighten the top five securing bolts. Now you'll be in a position to adjust the in and out position of the glass relative to its seal. To do that keep a hold of the glass with the sucker ensuring that it's pushed fully in against the, the brackets and then get your colleague to measure the distance, the gap between the cassette and the door frame. And what you'll need to do then is, is position a spacer in between those two 
to fill up that gap. So, for example, if you've got a 4mm gap between the cassette and the door frame, you'll need to fit a 5mm spacer. These spacers come in three thicknesses. You've got an 8mm thick, a 5 and a 3mm. Incidentally, if there's no gap between the bottom of the cassette frame and the door, then you'll need to fit a 3mm spacer, which will make sure that that glass is positioned correctly relative to the seal. So with that done, secure the two bottom bolts, and that's the cassette frame positioned correctly within the door. Now let's have a quick look at the Rover 200 Cabriolet. Bob. If you cast your mind back to the last edition of Technician's Update, we introduced the Rover 200 Cabriolet, took you through how the hood was actually built up, and also highlighted a few repairs that you can carry out. Now, no real problems to report since, except to say that one of the fixes we highlighted in the video and indeed in the repair manual is flawed. Now we told you to immobilise loose rivet heads that can become trapped in the hood frame during certain repairs, replacement of the headlining for instance, that you should inject body sealing wax into the hood frame spars. On reflection, not a good idea. What we found is on long term tests that particularly if the hood frame spars are overloaded with wax, that in hot weather, that wax can liquefy and seep out, contaminating the headlining. Now, there's a view data bulletin out at the moment telling you under no circumstances to inject wax into the hood frame, and the repair manual information will be updated in due course. Now, moving on, we'll just take a quick look at the operation of microcheck in relation to the map sensing hose on engines fitted with speed density fuel injection systems. So that's MEMS, PGMFI and the single point injection system. Now this map sensing pipe or the manifold absolute set pressure sensing hose to give it its full title is extremely important on these systems as it connects the inlet manifold to the ECU and informs it of engine load. The ECU then uses this signal together with the inlet air temperature and engine speed signals to calculate exactly how much fuel is needed by the engine. Now if you have a split or blockage in that pipe, then it will obviously affect the car's performance. Now Microcheck has no problem at all in finding a split in this hose, but what it won't do though is recognise a partial restriction. So if you're investigating a complaint of poor performance and suspect a partial blockage in this pipe is the cause, then replace the pipe and retest the car to confirm your suspicion. Now for something a bit different, gearbox overhaul on Rover 825 diesel. Now something to be aware of is that most of these overhaul jobs can in fact be done quite easily with the gearbox in situ. If you don't believe me, we'll take a look at this. They're a little bit heavy, these gear trains. But there we are, both input and output shafts out with the gearbox in situ. You'll find the access pretty good. No need even to remove the hub. Now from this that we can see that most of the components on those gear trains we can actually renew. So most of the bearings, the gears, the synchro hubs, selector forks, selector shafts and lugs all possible with the gearbox in situ. Certain jobs aren't possible. For instance the differential that's a gearbox out job. Similarly, with the output shaft front bearing, that's obscured by the differential gear, so we'll have to remove the gearbox for that. So how do you actually know whether to remove the gearbox or not? Well, as a rule of thumb, look at the times published in the ROT manual. If that tots up to less than six hours, then the chances are you'll have to carry the job out in situ. Now, as far as hints and tips go, some of the functions you'll have to carry out to get the gearbox in this state are obviously slightly more difficult because that gearbox is in situ. Access is a little bit tight under the bonnet. Now, particularly when you knock the roll pins from the selector shaft, you'll find it a nice care point to place under the gear trains, because the gear trains will be in at this stage, a piece of A4 paper so that when you knock those roll pins out, they're caught in the paper. And what you're trying to avoid there is any of those roll pins dropping into the differential casing. Obviously, you'd have to remove the gearbox for that. 
OK, that just about rounds up this edition of Technician's Update. I hope you found at least some of the information interesting. OK, if you have any ideas of further subjects for coverage on Technician's Update, then please don't hesitate to drop us a line. You'll find an address at the end of the programme. Thank you.